Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, thank you. Welcome to Securing Forgotten Devices in the Hospital. This is uh, the presenter is Sean Hughes. And before we get started, I want to go through a few housekeeping items. Everyone is going to be on mute. If you do have a question, um, I do encourage you to ask us, and we will address those questions as we go throughout the presentation, or we may save them for the end. Um, to do that in your panel, your control panel, you can click on the questions tab and then type in the question there and um, we will answer those. And I would like to introduce Sean Yu. He is EVP of Managed Document Services here at Synergist Tech. He has over 25 years experience and he specializes in developing highly efficient and cost effective service delivery organizations. And prior to joining Synergistic, he served numerous um, roles in IT and security at uh, Trinity Health, previously Catholic Health East. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Sean Yu. Thank you, Carrie, and uh, thank you everybody for taking the time out. Good morning, good afternoon to each of you wherever you may be located. Um, the intent of <clears throat> our presentation today is really to provide a perspective, a look at the industry, the activities that have been undertaken over the last several years that have impacted the, um, the organizations and the industry as a whole, understand what that threat landscape to that has uh, evolved to, to be, um, and to provide some opportunities or takeaways that organizations can begin to consider and look at. Um, the goal, again, is being more so to ignite and start a conversation and an understanding as to what's happening in your own individual organizations, what's happening from the industry perspective at all, uh, overall, and uh, what, what the manufacturer landscape looks like and how they're addressing that as well. So again, I appreciate the time out. There'll be some questions that we're, we'll, we will pose to you throughout. Um, and we have a little uh, takeaway for each of you at the end of the presentation that uh, I think you'll find of some interest. So why don't we go ahead and get started. And first and foremost, let's take a look at the impact the electronic health record and the other initiatives that we've undertaken as an industry as a whole have had an impact on. Um, so according to Health IT Dashboard, as of 2016, 95% of all eligible hospitals and critical access hospitals have demonstrated meaningful use of certified health IT. In addition to that, Another 60% of all U.S. office-based physicians, 20% of all nurse practitioners, and a 2% of the physician assistants have done this as well. So what that's actually provided for within the industry today is a time of a significant amount of data being transferred through our organizations that is unparalleled before. As you can see represented here, there is an entire continuum of life cycle of data and documents and, and information that's being inputted and outputted through our electronic health systems. Add into that the, the evolving models of ACOs and HIEs, acquisitions, mergers, and partnerships. It's not just our system anymore that is housing and transmitting and maintaining that data. We have other part, uh, uh, providers that are submitting data to us. We're submitting data to them so that the amount of information has multiplied significantly in a very short period of time. It's a lot of great work by the industry to achieve that level of certification of use of the, uh, of the IT, but it's created an opportunity that hasn't gone ignored. And it's not just the EHRs. Um, the, the advent of the biomedical devices and the continuing push for those devices to be in our environment, connected to our EHRs and supporting the clinical workflows um, has significantly increased over time. I mean, representation here is just a small subset of the total device types that are out there today. Uh, pulse oximeters, patient monitors, dialysis machines, smart beds, the list just continues to grow. Ventilators, fetal monitors, infant warmers. This device, these devices are in our environment today. They're being connected to our EHR to either transmit or receive data that is critically important to the care of the patient and the operations of our organizations. But the proliferation of these endpoints has created a landscape that has significant risk to it. Um, let's take a, <coughs> excuse me. So let's take a look at what's, a, what's the industry saying about the increase in these types of devices. Is it, is it just something that 
we're, we're not really seeing it materialize. Um, according to a, a survey by Logicalis, um, they're, predict they're, they're seeing an 11% increase in annual print volumes driven by meaningful use in particular, but that's not the only initiative that's kind of been driving the organizations through the utilization of additional data. We've got all the work that we've been doing around ICD-10, um, additional implementations of uh, physician-based uh, technologies and applications. And then if we take a look at the, the increase of biomed and IoT, Gartner predicts that by 2018, which is just a very short period of time away from us, there's going to be over 6 billion connected things requesting the support of IoT. These things, again, they include our traditional biomedical devices, but in addition to those devices, we also have the proliferation of the, of the wearables and the uh, medical devices, devices in patients' homes um, that are connected back to their physician's office or their, prim their, their primary uh, health providers that are transmitting and receiving data. Now, a lot of those devices are outside the control of our traditional security and IT infrastructure, but they're still endpoints within our organization that have traditionally been forgotten, um, the printers, the biomed devices. So we've had an increase in data. We've had an increase in requests for data. We're predicting that that model is not going to change at any time in the near future. So let's summarize real quick what we just saw here. Um, and EHRs have increased the amount of data that is moving through our organizations. You guys see this on a day-to-day -day basis. It's what you live and breathe. It's what you've been putting significant amount of tremendous effort into implementing within the healthcare organization. Um, CMS estimates that they have earmarked over $34 billion in incentive payments for meaningful use. So it's, there's a tremendous amount of money that is pushing us towards these, uh, these achievements and technology that have before been unforeseen within our industry. Printing has actually increased as a <clears throat> printing has actually increased as a result of the implementation of the technology. An eleven percent average increase of utilization of printed documents with the implementation of the technology. So the nirvana that we all thought was coming before us of this paperless world has not materialized. We're actually using much more paper today. And I think that if you took the time out and actually looked internal to your organization, your paper purchases are one indicator of an increase in that space. Take a look at how many more printers or print-related devices that are actually in your environment today. I, I Many years working within the hospital environments, there have been a number of times I could walk down any given hallway and there's a printer, a fax machine, a copier located right next door to each other or right on the same table. Um, and that continues to be the case today. So we are definitely printing more. We have more endpoint devices that are facilitating that function. Biomedical devices are increasing at an even more rapid rate um, and that are, are moving in even more significant data connected to patients and critically important in the care of those patients. Um, not referenced here, but um, when we talk about the IoT of things, so this is a, a, a very unique and emerging um, component of the information technology area and it really is a, an all-encompassing definition of devices that are leveraging <clears throat> the uh, connectedness of our world through the internet to be able to facilitate connectivity and transmission of data. So as I mentioned earlier in the slide, that is not just limited to those devices that are in our environment today, but iPads, iWatches, uh, devices within patients' homes, um, monitors that are being deployed. Um, majority of us probably have some sort of app on some mobile device that we use for monitoring our health. It's not a big leap to consider that that information could easily be requested to be transmitted to our primary care provider to monitor particularly chronic disease management where we're seeing the biggest proliferation of this. Expanded to the home care environment, and now we have mobile devices with our patient data connecting to devices in the patient home, transmitting back and forth. So IoT is a, is a general categorization for folks that aren't aware of what it is, and it's an emerging definition, but it's, it's kind of all-encompassing for anything that would use the Internet to connect to uh, back to our centralized systems. So we've, we've taken some time. We've identified that we've put a significant amount of time, effort, money into implementing a tremendous amount of technology. 
We've increased the digitalized data that is being moved through our organizations. We are printing more than we printed before the implementation of this technology. We have more devices that are requesting or receiving information, transmitting information related to that. And it's all great work. Um, but as we sit here and think about what that means, we've actually increased the prominence of, us, uh, of our, our industry as a target. Um, so we've, we, we've increased the threat landscape. So what I want to take a moment here is now that we've quantified that we're rich with all of this data and this potential and opportunity, what's the threat look like? So if we go ahead and take a look at the threat landscape, it, it, it's made up of two components the actors and the motivation for those actors. And you need to understand each of these as you develop your, your plans to address them because who's doing what for what reason has a uh, direct impact on what we need to do to prevent their ability to affect negative outcomes to us. So the actors actually range from very uh, sophisticated organized crime or state actors types of things down to the individual hacktivist or cyber thief who's working uh, independently by themselves. Um, and let's not forget that, that most dangerous of all is that potential insider who is working behind the scenes to affect some damage or, or impact to the organization. And what motivates this group of people? Why are they doing what they're doing? Uh, first and foremost, I think there's a, a large majority of this looking at financial gain. Um, for anybody that's familiar with the Ponemon Institute, that they produce a report on an annualized basis where they actually look at the cost of at a, a per uh, impacted patient uh, record. Um, healthcare continues to lead all industries in that overall cost. It's a little over $330 in the most recent report per impacted individual compared to a, a mean average for all industries of about $225. So. The, the, the actors have realized that our data is worth more to them, so they're much more incentivized to come after that data. Um, extortion, we've seen a very significant increase within the, or, uh, the uh, industry, both ours and others relevant to ransomware um, and, and holding our data <laughs> until such time that we actually pay or to get back access to that. It can be as simple as an ID theft or tax fraud for financial gain. Um, additional um, the uh, potential to just uh, harm the organization or provide embarrassment, which carries with it a multitude of different things that could come about from that. The bad press, the, 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 the negative impact, the great work that your organizations have done to get uh, your name recognized as the premier healthcare providers in your market. One bad event could really bring you quite far backwards in that process. And then a misleading indicator here is the, the, the term good intentions. And, there's a slide later on where I'll, where I'll express uh, how that could be misinterpreted, but those inside actors or those activists on the outside could just be coming to, up against your infrastructure to try and prove a point for their own purposes. So it's pretty much the same players, but a, a lot more threat within the threat landscape today. So if you look over time, the threat landscape's actually evolved as, as with anything as it normally does. And you, you look back and we were originally started out with being impacted by stolen or lost laptops, backup tapes or hard drives that went missing. Um, and we took action on that. We implemented a significant amount of security protocols and technology tools. We encrypted devices. We made sure that we were in, in protecting our environment to the best that we could. We were putting a wall around that environment, a wall around that data. Um, over time, that threat landscape has become much more mature and taken a different perspective on us. So we see a, bit, a, a large increase in actual hacking attacks coming in and looking for vulnerable points within that infrastructure to gain access to what we've now secured on the, on the lost devices. And at the same time, we've seen a, a very a wide variety of groups taking that that uh, approach. So there's actually state-sponsored groups or, or um, potential uh, terrorist organizations that are seeing this as an opportunity and and are moving into very sophisticated means to come about that. In addition to that, the evolution of the purpose for those uh, th those events has changed over time. It started out with just generic theft. So it was, a, it was as simple as looking for an opportunity to acquire a device, move it out of the organization, and, and see what you could do from that physical device to the extent now 
where it's much more sophisticated hacking attempts and even to the extent of trying to provide disruption to our ability to provide the clinical care to our patients that's at the core of our business model. So the, the landscape has, it has increased and matured over time as well as the purpose behind the actions that those individuals are taking. So just to reinforce some of that perspective uh, as we look at the industry reports here, according to a, uh, um, a recent um, publication by OCR, 21% of all healthcare breaches, breaches over 500 people were a result of paper. That's a significant amount of individuals that were impacted, not even by the normal security controls, but now it's the output of that paper that's sitting within our organization that we have to be and should be significantly concerned about. 26% um, of all significant data breaches were reported by IT managers. Now, this is a, 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 out, a, a output of a security survey. Um, they do not provide a definition of what a significant data breach is. But according to the individuals that were surveyed here in September 2015, 26% of the significant, what they qualified as a significant data breach reported by their IT managers involved their printer infrastructure. So a very significant component of those, but the IT managers even feel that there's a, there's a risk there. You look at the next data point, 64% of those IT managers believe their printers are likely infected with malware. So they're not even certain but they have a, 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 a very high perception that those devices are currently at risk with malware residing on them today. And then cybersecurity damage, according to a CSO in a December 2016 uh, blog post, they estimate that the cybercrime damage cost will hit six trillion annually by 2021. So there is a lot of perceived vulnerability, both from a technical and a process-driven component, and there's a lot of financial gain to be had, and this is not lost on those actors that we talked about before and why they're focusing in on healthcare and looking for these vulnerabilities as they exist today. So let's take a look for a moment at some industry, industry statistics, excuse me. So in a recent survey, uh, a report by Ponemon Institute published in 2015 titled The Insecurity of Network Connected Printers. This is specifically looking at how the industries across multiple, multiple verticals feel about the current position of those network connected printers. And for purposes of definition, in the, in the, relative to this survey, a network connected printer is a printer that is directly connected to your infrastructure and has an associated IP address or is a physical device on your, your, your network. This does the difference between a non-network connected printer is that is a connected that is connected to a computing device rather than directly to your network. So, 30% of those surveyed felt that uh, that uh, they did they included non-network devices in the security policy. So, only 30% of the individual surveys actually felt that non-network devices were being addressed. Additionally, 44% felt they do not have security policies for network devices today. So, even though they felt that 30% felt that the non-network being addressed, 44% said that they did not have comprehensive policies that specifically addressed the network connected devices. 64% of the survey respondents felt that they assigned a higher data risk to laptops and computing devices. And traditionally that would make sense, but as we're going to see, these devices have evolved significantly over time in their capabilities and their computing engines. Additionally, 62% were pessimistic about the ability to prevent a data loss associated to printer memory or printed documents. Now remember, 21% of all um, significant healthcare-related breaches affecting over 500 people were related to a printed document. Here, 62% were pessimistic about their ability to prevent that loss. So it, it, it kind of aligns one with the other that both what, we're, what the feeling is of the industry is also what's really happening out there. And most importantly, only 38% of the respondents believe information contained in printer memory is thoroughly wiped. And that's a very important component of, to the asset management life cycle of those devices is as they're being moved out of your organization um, and being replaced with more sophisticated devices, how confident are you that they're actually being wiped of the data that, you're, you're worried, that you should be worried about where, what's going to happen to it? 
So as we transition to the, the next point, there's a poll question that we'd like to pose to the group. So does your hospital security policies cover print, biomed, and IoT devices? Your policies today. Got about 50% of the people have voted. Give you a couple more seconds. And just to make sure that folks understand, the, the answers to these poll questions are anonymous. So yes, please feel are. free to answer uh, without any concerns or repercussions. <laughs> We're at about 80% of the people have voted, and we have 49% um, say yes, 18% say no, and 33% say they are unsure if their devices are uh, covered. So to the, to the individuals that said yes, I commend you um, for being uh, at the forefront of thinking and ensuring that these devices are there. For those that said no, I thank you for your honesty. Um, and for those that said not sure, um, my recommendation is that you, the outcome of this dialogue would hopefully spur you to uh, partner with the individuals in your organization responsible for those areas and start to develop those policies to ensure that th these devices are included. So, thank you all very much for your, your willingness to answer that. So we talked a bit before about the lack of confidence in the ability to thoroughly wipe um, uh, the hard drives that are associated to these devices. We talked about the fact that 21% of the re uh, reportable breaches of over 500 people are the result of paper. Why is that important when we talk about printing devices? Well, as I mentioned earlier, printing devices have evolved significantly in a very short period of time around their computing capabilities. They're no longer just a pass-through device that's taking the information and putting it out, out to paper. The average multifunction device copier, what is traditionally called within our organization, one of the most pop, uh, um, popular models that's sold today, has on average about a 320 gigabyte hard drive. So that's a pretty substantial hard drive that is able to store that information um, so that the it is in its internal memory so that it's available as needed for a later for later purposes. Um, <coughs> so what does that mean? What can be stored on a 320 gig hard drive? So let's take a look for a minute just at Excel files. So in, in its most recent versions of Excel, Excel has the capacity for over a million rows of data. One gigabyte can hold on average about 1,300 Excel files. Now, 320 gigabyte could potentially house over 400,000 Excel files, with each with the capacity for over a million rows. So if we look at 400,000 potential files, each with the potential for a million rows of data, and I'm not an expert at using the new math that my kids ask me to help them with on a normal basis every night from school, that's over 400 billion potential individual data points on a single a single 320 gig hard drive that we're not certain it's actually being wiped effectively before it's moved out of our environment and oh by the way we're not even certain if there's patient information in those files that are being printed out and what's happening to that printed document once it actually goes out into the environment is it being shredded effectively is it going off to a secure storage does it need to um, it's not just Excel either. If you look at Word on average, um, a one gigabyte would equate to about 60,000 Word files. And if it was a straight text file, it's probably about 400,000 text files to a one gigabyte drive. So these machines can and do house a tremendous amount of data. Now, whether that data qualifies as PHI or it doesn't or confidential proprietary information, we don't know. And we need to know whether where that data is going. And if you think this is not a reality, what I'd ask as a simple exercise that each of us could undertake is go look at your personal drive on your network and see how many of these file types exist and whether or not you could ascertain whether there's confidential or proprietary information within that, that file type. Even more so, go take a walk through some of the back office functions and see some of the desktops that are littered with the documents that are stored directly to the desktop of the environment that could easily be printed out to the physical device itself. So we've got another poll question for the group. 
Are you confident you could identify the patient or, otherwise, uh, or other individuals impacted if one of these devices was compromised? Again, the responses are anonymous, um, so we'd appreciate each of you taking time um, to give us a little thought today. Um, so while you're each taking the time to respond to that, I did want to just point out that 10% um, of the Ponemont respondents are healthcare and pharma. So healthcare is probably higher in these stats uh, that we represented because it's behind the other industries. So not give an indication that uh, of false pretenses as to the level of assurances that we each have in our, our industry. It looks like uh, nearly everyone has voted and it's pretty even. We have 30%, 36% say yes. 31% say no, and 33% say not sure. So again, um, I, I think the large percentage would reside within the no and not sure, um, and that you know personally provides a, 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 um, a lot of concern that I think that appropriate actions internally taken by each organization to determine what can be done. Um, look at your partners in this space that are helping you facilitate and manage those devices and environment. Um, and there are tools and, and processes available today that can be implemented. So when we, we look at the data, we know we have a tremendous amount of it is of high value to those individuals that would have uh, less than positive intentions for it. And we look at the threat landscape and the actors there um, and the data points that are coming back in survey. It's not just theory. And these are just snippets of certain headlines that have been produced in the, just in the last couple months. Um, there was a hacker that was able to send Nazi flyers to thousands of printers in the, in the Internet of Things, the, that IoT, and did it as an experiment. So this perceived you know, good intentions label again. Another hacker hijacks thousands of publicly exposed printers to one others. So in this instance, it was a, a young teenage individual that um, had some free time on their hands and wanted to, what he felt was to expose the vulnerabilities that are associated to these print devices and actually hijacked, uh, I believe it was over 150,000 printers um, at one time that had them spitting out, um, thankfully, non-harmful text and images, but imagine what they could have done. They're in, they're connected to those devices today. So it's really happening on the printer side. And you know, a lot of folks will ask, well, is it, is it just uh, the printers that, well, let's take a look at the biomed devices. So uh, Beth Israel, fetal monitors were infected with malware and the manufacturer did not permit OS updates and patches. And as my colleague Carrie alluded to, I spent a good majority of my career on the healthcare side, the provider side, working in IT and, and information security. And it was always a struggle for us to collaborate with the manufacturers in this space to allow us to include these devices within our patch management processes. So here we have a real case of that happening. Um, I want to talk about patient impact. Hematology monitor was disabled during an antivirus scan. The machine had to be rebooted during an operation. So what that meant was you had a, a live patient under sedation that was unmonitored for five minutes. Um, I don't think any of us, particularly within the field that we've chosen, would want that event to happen or be a potential to happen within our organization. So the VA, one of the largest healthcare organizations in the United States or the world, um, identified recently 142 separate instances of malware affecting over 207 devices. And if you look at the, 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 the identification of those, the, the operational departments that were impacted, these are all clinical patient care uh, departments across the continuum. So as these devices are being used to connect to patients to provide life-saving and, and, and critical care, we're not certain as to are they vulnerable at that moment in time? Could they have a negative impact? So what are the vendors? Uh, Merlin and Home in February of 2017 confirmed that vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities of their platform could actually put patients at risk. I think uh, everybody on the, uh, on the webinar today and everybody in our industry and across multiple industries saw quite a bit of publications around the WannaCry virus, but um, Bayer Medical actually had their, med their biomedical devices were impacted and reported that in May of 2017. So um, it, it is not just theory. It's happening in, in the real world today. We've got um, actual instances of patient care being impacted. We've got um, manufacturers that are coming forward and, and, and affirming that their products are either at risk or are being impacted today. 
Um, Want to play a video? Um, this is an indication of a response from a manufacturer that um, is a very powerful video that gives an indication of their acknowledgement of the threat within the industry and their development of comprehensive services and product offerings to address that threat. medical equipment on earth. But, like most businesses, they're also crawling with unsecured printers like this guy. Without BIOS level protection to be safe, they would walk up and install just about anything. Now, that little software update just allowed me to create a back door directly into their network. I just changed Todd's name and the system. John, thanks a lot. He can't keep his name straight. <laughs> now, if someone is white or say anyone from the security team back at the office calls looking for him in an emergency, no one's going to be able to find him. Nobody ever suspects the printer. So that is a one in a, a series of uh, multiple videos created by HP that are easily available on YouTube. I would recommend um, the viewing the, the full series. Um, it's very powerful. Um, poor Todd, now John Smith, um, who knows what the outcome will be, and maybe that is a continuation in this. But as you can see, the, the manufacturers know or are aware that these risks are out there. They're developing products and services to address or, or provide uh, solutions to the industry relevant to those risks. Um, and as uh, my good friend Christian Slater says there, nobody ever suspects the printer. So let's summarize real quick on, uh, on the, this section of our dialogue. So we acknowledge that hacking is on the rise, on the rise and that healthcare is a primary focus for that. Um, we see, uh, the, based on the survey results, that providers definitely feel they're at risk uh, particularly in part to these unsecured devices and endpoints related to printers, biomed, or IoT of those devices. Those end endpoints are being leveraged by hackers today. It's real. It's happening. Um, it's in the news. The manufacturers are, are, are using it as a, a leverage point to continue to develop opportunities. Um, and the issues that are causing this are consistent across the device landscape. So the very same video could probably be made for a multitude of biomedical devices um, some of the mobile devices, all those different things that are coming into it. They're real, they exist, it's happening um, within your environment today, whether we're aware of it or not. So we've, we've quantified that it's happening, we've quantified that we've got a lot of data, we're a prime target, um, but what can we do uh, as, a, as an individual, as an organization, or even more so as an industry? Um, you, as with anything, the most important component of this is you first need to know what you have in order to identify what the risk is. So our recommendation, our program offerings that we bring to our clients starts with an assessment of identifying all of these assets today. Um, it's particularly important within this space because the responsibility and ownership of these devices is spread across multiple components of your organization and possibly even multiple third parties. So if you look at the traditional distribution of print responsibility, the MFDs or copiers are usually a relationship that supply chain manages through GPOs and other components and then they're serviced and supp supported by those manufacturers or another third party. Um, and then the physical print devices are actually a component of the IT responsibility and again may have a third party. The biomed devices are even a, a, a bigger issue of who has responsibility because you have multiple vendors who sell and manufacture those devices, and then they have individual service contracts um, that may or may not have any oversight within the organization. So you have multiple different asset databases out there without one single point to be able to say, I know what's in my environment at any given time. So assess, identify the assets. Once you've identified the asset, take it a step further. 
understand the costs associated to those devices, understand who the providers are, who the service providers are, who the manufacturers are, who's accountable for what component of it. Document and understand the utilization of the devices within your organization. So how are they facilitating the process of delivering the individual workflows and is that a necessity? What's the business driver behind the proliferation of these devices within the organization? Because you want to have an understanding of how you can affect a change in the number of those vulnerable endpoints within your organization. Once you have all of this information, it is critically important to perform a risk assessment to understand the vulnerabilities at an individual device level. Now this can be or should be part of your overall security program risk assessment approach. And if it isn't today, it should immediately be expanded to include these devices and identify what those risks are, develop a remediation plan and monitor that activity, hold individuals accountable to moving the needle on your risk profile. And as I said, if it's not part of your security program today, apply, make it part and apply the appropriate controls based upon your individual security program that you've adopted. And if, if you're not there yet, then there's some additional work to do. So <clears throat> just as a, a, a method of an example, we talked about those three or four steps that you can take. Those should be part of a larger um, control framework. And here's an example of just um, one that was published by CIS, which is a nonprofit organization that works with providers to develop um, recommended control frameworks around um, the uh, controls of the internet. So as we said, inventorying those devices, so all the software associated to it, doing a vulnerability assessment remediation, looking at your network and how these devices are, are, are connected and exposed, the ports, the protocols and services, um, maybe even performing some penetration tests and red team exercises to see if the, the Wolf video could be filmed in your facility tomorrow. But don't stop there. There's additional controls that should be taken and, and put into place and you can see these here. Uh, again, each individual organization should have or may have adopted a control framework that's respective or reflective of their information security program. Um, bringing these devices in allows you to apply all of the appropriate controls over time and make sure that you're addressing and identify, identifying and addressing the risk appropriately. So a couple tips um, from my, my, my experience both on the provider side and now on the service provider side for these device types. So the more devices you have means a larger uh, a surface for the attackers. So you want to do the most you can to understand what's minimally necessary to support your organization and then lock those devices down as tightly as you can. Update those devices, those embedded devices, as regularly as you're, you can. Um, if you think of the biomed devices that as they sit in the corner or they sit in the storage room while they're not being used, are we certain that by the time somebody goes to grab one of those devices to bring it back out onto the unit that it's current, it's not, it, the vulnerabilities are addressed? Look at your firewalls and your VLAN and make sure that you're closing all of those potential holes for folks to come through. Um, look at those devices, particularly the print devices out there. Make sure those default passwords have been changed. I can't count the number of times on both sides of my responsibilities over my career that I've been able to walk up to a physical device and see that the, manu the, the factory settings are still in place or that there's no security settings whatsoever. Use protected network segments and again, your, your, apply your appropriate uh, control framework um, and, and read the terms and conditions of your manufacturers of the product as well as your service providers and identify who has these responsibilities. Where should this work be being performed? Continue tips, uh, when you think about the, the, the printers, so we talked about the more devices you have, the more risk you have, so decrease the devices. And, and decrease the risk, and, you know, particularly if you think about uh, printers, um, you know, the, the volume of the, the print is the underlying business driver for the need for the printed device. So if you can think of ways or look at ways, partner with your MPS service provider and identify opportunities to drive the printed volume down, you decrease the need for the number of devices that have to be secured or prov provide a potential vulnerability. 
but you also decrease that outputted page, which is again 21% of the uh, reported breaches, uh, uh, breaches over five, impacting over 500 individuals. So there's definite value in taking that work on. Change the default settings. Use FSL and TLS and other complex technical security uh, components, but make sure those devices are configured to your standards and that there is a process for ensuring that those devices maintain that security posture through their life cycle of, the, uh, of their time within your organization. Software patches, updates, secure configurations. You know, we, the, the healthcare industry has done a tremendous amount of work around making sure that the computing devices in our computing environment adhere to these very standard practices. Not the same can be said relevant to the printers, the biomed devices, the IOTs. So we've got to make sure that we've got these processes applied to these device types, that we're patching them, we're making sure the configurations meet our requirements, that we know who is responsible, that we're testing it periodically, and giving that level of confidence to the organization that we've got this under control. <clears throat> this sounds pretty simple um, and generic, but printers should not be exposed to the internet. Um, I can't tell you the number of times that I've partnered with clients um, and a very powerful executive or physician or someone in the organization has come forward with a very simplistic request that, quote unquote, I want to be able to print from anywhere. So in their haste to make those executives or those powerful individuals in the organization happy, the easiest answer is open up that printer to the internet and now a gaping hole exists. So we've made the, the business unit happy, but we've taken the wrong approach to that. Um, and then the phys physical security of those devices, um, you know, that video we just watched for the wolf is predicated on the fact that an individual unbeknownst to the department was able to walk right up to a device, plug in a uh, remote memory, and install something that allowed them a backdoor entrance. Physical security is as important as technical security, and we need to make sure that those devices, particularly in those open general areas, have the most comprehensive controls on them. Now let's summarize what it is that, we, that can be done. Identify all the assets, identify the risks associated to those devices, ensure the devices are addressed as part of your programs and your policies. Ident assess, identify risk, and build a mitigation plan. And then look for ways to reduce the unnecessary devices or the proliferation of those devices within your organization. So a lot of information, um, a lot of uh, things to think about. Um, just to kind of give a perspective of why, why is Synergistic presenting on the, the printers and the biomed devices? What do we do in this space? So Synergistic is a combination of, of two historical organizations, Synergistic being the recognized uh, best-in-class cybersecurity provider for healthcare, has a long history and tradition of partnering with our healthcare clients to build their security programs to ensure that they're addressing their regulatory requirements for security, privacy, um, compliance. Um, the merger of our two, uh, two organizations, so Exilio being the second component of that, Exilio's history is in the managed print services environment. Um, and bringing those two organizations together and the, the Exilio discipline around understanding how to apply asset management principles to the wide variety of devices to give visibility to the utilization and vulnerabilities of those fleets within the organization and then partner with our clients to drive strategies to reduce the, the number of those devices, the cost associated to those devices, and the risk associated to those devices through the organization was a very natural marriage. So um, it's been a very interesting time over the last three and a half years, plus years that I've been with the organization. And we have a very unique approach and service offering to the industry. Uh, but ultimately, what I hope is that you each have taken away from this presentation is some visibility and understanding to uh, an area of the organization that may have flown under the radar but needs to have the same level of attention um, and uh, priority as the rest of the infrastructure, um, ensuring that the data that we use and need to provide the services is readily available, it's secure, it's private, it's confidential, and that we're not neg negatively impacted by these high-risk devices. Uh, we actually have a question. 
Mm -hmm. um, if you have a compromise to one of these devices, how would you or could you identify the data on the device? So, depending upon the maturity of your underlying program, there are a variety of tools that are available within the industry today that we as a MPS security provider try to introduce into those organizations. So, traditional for folks that have MPS programs today, there's a lot of visibility to your utilization at a black and white color ratio. But there are software solutions that allow you to drill down and understand where that data, it, what the data is that's moving, what applications it's coming from, where it's going. So your asset inventory should also be married with your, your, your data management plan and the software to support that. So what data is being pushed out, printed out to the organizations, what data resides, which printers are likely to have potential PHI or confidential information. And then those, pr those printers should be given a priority level within the remediation plan and effort to ensure if it's necessary for them to store that information, that it's encrypted in transit, it's encrypted in its location, it's wiped, you're certified it's wiped when that device is removed from the organization. So there are tools out there that we can we, we provide introduction into our clients at, um, and uh, be more, more than glad to share what some of those tools are. Um, they're, they're, they're not our, our tools, they're partner tools, so um, they do take some implementation and, and integration into your overall program. Um, but first and foremost, I think getting an understanding of the proliferation of the devices, um, you want to make sure that you're incurring the cost to secure and identify the fewest number of devices before you go forward and look at a tool and just throw it out onto a, a number of devices that may not be long-term necessary within your organization. Um, and then I think this question came in earlier, so you may have addressed it, but what do you recommend as a first step? So I think we've, we've taken some of that first step today through the poll questions and um, asking yourself as an organization, do you have a high level of confidence that you know what data is being moved across your organization? You know what assets and are they a part of your security program? But beyond that, my recommendation to uh, anyone I, I, I talk to in this space is really engage in an assessment process. Understand the devices, the printers, the biomed devices, the IoT. Quantify your environment because everything else is going to start from there. There's a variety of different service offerings within the, org the industry. Uh, Synergistic has those as well. A lot of times they're specific to manufacturer makes or models, and that's somewhat of the uh, you know, differentiating factor for the synergistic business model is that we are vendor agnostic and our, our assessments actually cover all platforms and devices rather than concentrating on just a subset that are, that are part of my portfolio of devices that I sell. Uh, one last question. Um, if I printed an Excel spreadsheet, the process you were describing, would you be able to tell me what data was in the spreadsheet or just that the spreadsheet was sent to the printer? So the, the, at, the, at its base, most software solutions would be able to tell you that the Excel spreadsheet was printed to the printer. There are associated other technical applications like DLP solutions and other things that can be coupled with that information to go back to the source file and say what was in that actual document itself. So there's a, this is the importance of ensuring that you marry, whether it's your biomed program or your MPS program, with your security program and leverage the investments that you've either made or are making within your data center and your computing architecture and make sure it's being deployed into your print and biomed infrastructure as well. Okay. Um. Well, one last question. Uh, what is the cost of that technology you're talking about? So I talked about a couple technologies there. Um, and it, it, it's as normal with any solution, it's hard to give a quantifiable cost. Um, but majority of the pricing models, when you talk about things that are going to monitor the physical devices, are based upon the number of devices on a recurring month, usually monthly basis, um, which is referred to usually as a seat license. So Go back to my point of making sure that you take the effort first in identifying those unnecessary devices because the last thing you want to do is buy a software solution for an environment that you're going to try and shrink over time. Um, there are also some of the, 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 the technical or security devices that or applications that are actually um, part of your enterprise solutions within your data center today. 
So there are programs like ours where some of some of those um, preliminary solutions are part of um, the varying um, ranges of our program offering. <coughs> if you're looking at an MPS program, some of these solutions should and could be offered as an overall component of your click rate. So um, there's a there's a lot of different ways to um, come to that price component. Thank you, Sean. Um, I hope everyone in gained some invaluable information, and I want to thank you for participating. As a follow-up, you'll receive an email from me, Carrie Mulcahy, um, early next week with the presentation, along with um, a short survey, just so we can learn how we can improve these sessions for you. And in addition, there's going to be a link to a mini self-assessment um, on your print devices that you can take, and we will be able to send you back a report that shows you um, the findings and kind of where you go or you know where your results are. So again, thank you. And um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to Sean or myself. Thank you. Thank you all.